This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Uh, I want to jump a few chapters and go straight to the, um, the last big numbers area. I'm going to have the way, which is consolidated accounts. Um, uh, you'll see there are several chapters on this uh, as I build up the various little problems that can be. But essentially what we're talking about here is suppose we've got one company that effectively owns another company. All right? So I've got a company here. league has got a company. My company owns the shares in Liga's company. Well, when you've got that situation where one company strictly controls the other, but I'll define what I mean by that later, but if one company owns another company, effectively, my shareholders, they own my company, obviously, but if my company owns Liga's company, my shareholders own all of it. You understand me? And so in that sort of situation, the rules say that although most, both companies will prepare their own balance sheet and income statement, we've got to prepare an extra balance sheet for the whole group, for both companies together, as though it's one big company. All right? And if you look at page uh, 141, there are various definitions, which I'll go through them all as we uh, come to them. Uh, but for the moment, um, the three important ones, you'll see parent company and subsidiary. Parent company is the company that owns the other one. So if my company owns Ligas, my company is the parent. The subsidiary company is the other company, the one that's owned. You with me? So Ligas, my subsidiary. The two together, we say, are the group. And we've got to prepare not just accounts for my company and her company separately, but as I just said, another set of accounts for the whole group, for both companies together. Okay? So, let's start off with a nice easy one before I... We start to look at the complications. Can you look at example one f with me? Example one. Um, on Jan 1st of January 2008, P acquired 100% of the ordinary shares of S, which was incorporated on that date. Incorporated it means it was formed. So S was formed on the 1st of January 2008. And on the day it was formed, P bought 100% of the shares. All right? So P owns S. P is the parent company. S is the subsidiary, which is why I rather neatly called them P and S. Uh, and uh, it says there on the 31st of December 2010... So what, two years later or whatever, three years later? Um, the statements of financial position of each of the two companies were as follows. So both companies prepare their own set of accounts. S, exactly as normal, you've got S, non-current assets, current assets, share capital. And of course, because the company's been there, it been in business for two or three years, we're not surprised S has retained earnings. Agreed? 8,000 current liabilities. So you've got an ordinary balance sheet. Uh, and also P prepares its balance sheet. And importantly, in P's balance sheet, you can see one of their assets. They've got the investment in S. So P had bought the shares in S. In their balance sheet, they've got the amount they paid, 10,000, like any asset. And of course, the 10,000 they'd paid was for those 10,000 the share capital of S. Clear? So they both prepared their own balance sheet. They must prepare their own accounts as normal. But because P owns S, we've got to prepare an extra set of accounts 
the consolidated accounts, again, as if it's one big company. Okay? And all we do, it's so easy, it's untrue. Sorry, if I turn the screen on. We prepare our consolidated statement of financial position. I'm not going to keep writing that. I've told you before. It's another word for balance sheet. But I know I've said it twice, so let me say a third time. <clears throat> All we're doing is preparing a balance sheet as though it's simply one big company. My shareholders, P shareholders, effectively own everything in both companies. You'd agree? And so we just go through and add up. The non-current assets, well, what are they in the two companies together? There's 25,000 in P, there's another 12,000 in S. The non-current assets are 30, uh, 37,000. What about the current assets? Again, we simply add up, for the group as a whole, what are non-current as as current assets? P has 8,000, S has 9,000, a total 17,000. And so the total assets of the two companies together are what? 54,000. Who owns all those assets? Well, it's my shareholders. My shareholders own P, but P owns S. And so, the share capital is my shareholders. The share capital is the share capital of P, which is 25,000. You would agree? Those shareholders own everything? But, of course, they're owed more because of retained earnings. And how much profit belongs to my shareholders? Surely they're entitled to all the profit in P, 15,000. But in addition, because they, my company owns S, they're entitled to all the earnings of S as well, another 8,000, the total 23. And so in total, my shareholders are, if you like, worth 48,000. But finally, what about the current liabilities? Well, again, simply add up. <clears throat> For the group as a whole... Uh, P owns, what was it, 3,000? S owns, owes 3,000 as well. A total of 6,054. All right? Does that make sense, everybody? Now, all right, it'd be too easy for various reasons, as you'll see. There are several complications that can arise. But is everybody clear in principle what's going on? That we're just doing it as though there is one big company. Sorry, keep repeating. But it's P's shareholders effectively own everything. And so, all the assets, all the liabilities of the two together... Again, it's P shareholders who own them all. We've just one big balance sheet, as though it's one big company. And of course, that investment in S disappeared. The inv uh, P's investment of 10,000, in a sense, we've replaced it by all the assets and liabilities um, of S, the company that we owned. All right? Everybody happy? Oksana? No problem. All right, well, as I said, uh, I hope you agree that's easy enough. But for various reasons, 
there can be a few little problems. And the first one is on page 143, example 2. It's added up pre-acquisition profits. I'll use the example to explain what I mean and how we deal with it. Look at the example. Again, P acquired 100% of the share capital of S. So they own all the shares. They bought them on the 1st of January 2006. They paid 28000 But this time, S... The company already existed. You know, in the previous example, we bought the shares on the day the company was formed. But here, S has already been uh, in business. They've already been earning money. It says they had retained earnings of 8,000. And then we bought 100%. Clear? Again, I've given you the balance sheets, this time at 31st December 2009, so three, four years later. S, as normal, non-current assets, current assets, share capital. Look at retained earnings, though. At the, uh, on the 1st of January 2006, S, the retained earnings were 8,000. But we are now, two or three years later... And hardly surprisingly, S's retained earnings have grown. They've been earning more, it's now 15,000. Well, that's S, but look at P. P prepares its own balance sheet, and again, exactly as normal. But in P's balance sheet is their investment in S, the amount they paid for the shares. Well, of course, why did they pay 28000 Surely, the consideration, the amount they paid, 28 And why did they pay 28 Because surely, what they were buying, they were buying the share capital of S, they were buying all the shares, which were 20000 but, at the date of purchase, uh, S had already been earning money. S already had retained earnings. It says at the top, at the date of purchase, the retained earnings were 8,000. So surely, they were effectively buying S when S was worth 28,000. Would you agree? And so, I'm not surprised. That's why they paid 28. I'm oh, sorry, writing all that down. I mean, it's fairly obvious. But are we all clear? The amount they pay, they obviously pay for the shares. But if they've all, the company's already earned profits, I hope you agree, we're not surprised. They have to pay more because they're buying those earnings. Well, again, let's now... At 31st December 2009, prepare the consolidated balance sheet. And exactly like before, we're doing it as though it's one big company and its shareholders in P who effectively own everything. They obviously own P, and because P owns S, they own S as well. So, let's go through and add up. First of all, the non-current assets of the group. Uh, P's are 55,000. S is 25,000. A total of 80,000. What are the current assets of the group? Uh, P owns 18. Uh, S owns 14. 32. And so the total assets of the group, I hope somebody's checking me, but I think 112,000? No problem. 
Where's the money owed? Well, of course, we've got current liabilities in a minute. But what about the shareholders? The share capital. Well, yet again, and always the same, the people who own the whole thing are the shareholders of P. So the share capital of P is 60,000. And what about the retained earnings? The retained earnings, there and are my shareholders, are entitled to all the earnings of P, which are what, 38,000? They're entitled to the earnings of S, but... Surely, they're only entitled, in this sense, to the amount that's been earned since the date we bought it. And how much has been earned since we bought S? Uh, yeah, S, at the moment, it's retained earnings of 15,000. But when we bought it, they'd already got earnings of eight. And so how much have they earned since we bought the company? Since we bought it, the earnings have been 7,000. You agree? And so the total retained earnings uh, for the group as a whole, 38 from P, always all of P's. The amount from S since the date we bought the company, in the seven, the retained earnings, 45,000. And so the amount belonging to my shareholders is 105. And finally, of course, current liabilities. Add them up. 3,000 in P, 4,000 in S, 7,112. So there's your first extra bit, but does that make sense, please? The amount you paid for the shares, the amount P paid. I said before, and you seemed happy enough, that they're paying more than share capital because they were buying the retained earnings. That's why they paid 28. But equally, the earnings belonging to our shareholders, the retained earnings in the consolidated, it's all of P, it's all of S, since we bought um, the company. Okay? Well, the little bit of terminology. These earnings, um, the earnings that were already there when we bought the company, these are called pre-acquisition. So the pre-acquisition earnings, we actually paid for them. It was part of the cost of the investment. Pre-acquisition. Those we'd paid for, they were part of the cost. The uh, current earnings that belong to us, in the consolidated balance sheet, I said it was all of P plus what S had earned since we bought it. That 7,000 since we bought it is called post-acquisition. And so, well, we're going to keep doing it. I won't write it down as a rule, but always the retained earnings in the consolidated balance sheet, they're always... Everything in P, which hope clearly belongs to our shareholders, plus the post-acquisition earnings of S. All right? Everybody happy there? Okay, can we bring in one more little problem? Can you turn over to example three?